taught by me. It's me, Mansoor Khan. And uh, this uh, course is being offered at CUI Islamabad in fall 2021 term. Um, this course is more, uh, more of it is related to the uh, understanding design and analysis of uh, RF circuits. Now, RF circuits, uh, they can, for example, generate, uh, detect, modulate, demodulate RF signals. Okay. I mean, we can have, a, for example, an impedance matching circuit which can, uh, which can transform a certain impedance to match a generator uh, resistance or impedance for maximum power transfer, let's say. Or we can have a, have a mixer which, uh, you know, can modulate an RF carrier. It can change its... Uh, uh, physical quantities like amplitude, uh, frequency, or phase, and then that modulated carrier can be transmitted uh, on a certain channel, and it can be broadcasted before it is received. So uh, RF circuits, it, it, it's more of uh, uh, this course has to, more, has to do more with the designing of such circuits to meet certain applications. Okay. Now, um, the textbook to follow for this course is, uh, is John B. Hagen. Uh, second edition is available online. Uh, you can get a copy of it. Uh, so this is the textbook we are going to consult for this course. Um, now, uh, this is uh, the, the, this is the figure which shows you the eight decades of uh, radio bands uh, to start with. Uh, so you must understand that uh, RF signals have frequencies ranging from uh, from very low frequencies from 30 kilohertz all the way up to 300 gigahertz. It's a very high frequencies. You you see this um, about this range. Uh, some upper uh, four bands are of uh, microwave range. I mean these are microwave frequencies ranging from one meter wavelength to one mm wavelength, which corresponds to the frequencies of 300 megahertz uh, all the way up to 300 gigahertz. Uh, so, uh, there are eight decades of radio bands on the electromagnetic spectrum with uh, uh, each band having uh, suited to different applications. For example, at very low frequencies, uh, ranging from 30 kilohertz and above, these frequencies are used for communications, uh, at submarine communications. Uh, the frequency allocations are as such. Uh, the 30 kilohertz, it's about 100 kilometer wavelength, it's a large wavelength. And they are they are suited for uh, submarine uh, communications, navigations. Okay, similarly to for, for, okay, for from 30 kilohertz all the way up to uh, 300 kilohertz. So it's a low frequency band, and it's still being used uh, for navigation, uh, radio time signals. Uh, then we have uh, the uh, Pioneer AM broadcasting service, which is uh, which is about 300 kilohertz, and this is a medium frequency band. And uh, the wavelength is ranging from 10 kilometers to 1,000 uh, meters or one kilometer. Uh, then from for, for high frequencies, uh, which is suitable for short wave broadcasting and communications. So you see, uh, as the uh, frequency is rising, I mean, the wavelength is becoming shorter. So at very high frequencies, we have, for example, FM broadcasting is from uh, is from 88 megahertz to uh, 100 megahertz, as most of you guys know. So this is uh, not only limited to the car radios. I mean, now we have, for example, uh, TV broadcast, which is at the same frequency band, and we have digital uh, modulation schemes for it. I mean, it's not only the analog modulation. We have uh, digital broadcast, for example, in this range. Um, so it, as, as the frequency uh, is, uh, is becoming higher, we have more... Uh, data transmission rates available, more data can be transmitted with high performance and efficiency. So uh, more TV channels, you see, can be accommodated. And as you go into the microwave frequency range, uh, we have ultra high frequency in which there are, uh, again, you can have uh, digital broadcast with RGB uh, TV channels, okay. Uh, you can have HGTV, for example. So, so there are more services, more uh, information, more bandwidth that is available uh, at high frequencies. At high frequencies, and uh, you have again more um, uh, applications like GPS navigations, okay, radar communications. So from one millimeter to one mm, uh, you have uh, more of uh, 
microwave applications. For example, uh, we have satellite TV, satellite communication, so satellite can be transmitting back to Earth stations, uh, the weather forecast, for example. And that is done at super high frequency, which is uh, from 3 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz. And then you have uh, even higher frequencies, like extremely high frequency, and this is millimeter wave radar applications. So uh, there are certain advantages associated with high frequencies. For example, in these, uh, this frequency range, you have high uh, uh, bandwidth that is available. You have a higher bandwidth, which implies that uh, you, have, you can transmit more data uh, efficiently, uh, there will be less fading, for example, uh, there will be less bending by the ionosphere. I mean, as the frequency is rising, uh, there's more energy uh, in the waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. So line of sight, for example, uh, line of sight communications are, are possible. Uh, then, uh, for example, the, the, the circuit sizes, they, they are becoming smaller, okay? For example, uh, you might have an antenna which has a certain physical length. Uh, let's say this length is, is small l, and uh, this is the physical length. And as you in, go on increasing the wavelength, you see, uh, as you go on increasing the frequency, the wavelength is decreasing, right? I mean, the wavelength, lambda, goes on decreasing. It becomes, it's, it's a millimeter wave, okay, uh, as a limit in, in the RF band. So the electrical length is increasing. I mean, in terms of wavelengths, how many wavelengths uh, an antenna can occupy, and, 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 and uh, the length of an antenna is equivalent to, for example, as the uh, frequency is rising, the wavelength is becoming smaller and smaller. So uh, the electrical length of the antenna is uh, is increasing, okay? That means you can have miniaturized antenna for GSM communications, for satellite communications, okay? So the size of antenna is becoming smaller, uh, at the same time, the gain of, uh, you, you can have a very small antenna with a very high gain, okay, at, at these frequencies. So, besides uh, high, uh, higher bandwidth and line of sight communications, your circuit size, size sizes are becoming smaller, okay. You cannot, you're not looking at lumped elements, you're looking at the distributed uh, quantities because current and voltages are becoming uh, distributed physical quantities. Uh, they are a function of space and time. Uh, because as the as the uh, as the wavelength is becoming uh, smaller, the for example uh, for, an, for a certain electrical component, the the dimension, the physical dimension of uh, uh, a certain electrical component becomes comparable to the wavelength. Okay, and in that case, you cannot treat the voltage and the current as a lumped uh, physical quantity. It has to be treated at a distributed quantity. Okay, I mean at a certain uh, let's say let's say uh, point in time. For example, this is uh, this is a current and voltage waveform. So you have to see, okay. For example, this is directed. The wave is traveling at z directed. It's a z directed waveform. Uh, so you have to see. I mean, this this could be a voltage waveform and this could be a current waveform. And uh, you have the the impedance at any particular instant uh, is defined as vz by iz, and that's the impedance at that particular point. Okay. So uh, the impedance. Uh, the current voltage becomes the function of space, right? So at high frequencies, uh, this is an advantage besides higher bandwidth and line of sight communications that your uh, circuit sizes are, are becoming smaller. They, they're not the lumped components. They, I mean, the same filter could be a microstrip-based uh, uh, microstrip uh, uh, which, is, which is based on a PCB. Uh, it could be a microstrip having a certain physical dimension, let's say a certain physical length, and width, which is defining uh, the cutoff frequency, okay, of a filter, uh, how much bandwidth of a filter is, and the frequency that is going to pass. So you might have a, let's say, on a on a certain uh, substrate, you might have a sir, uh, this this could be a metal wire, which is going to you know pass certain frequencies and reject others. But on the other hand, I mean, at low frequency, you can have a you can have equivalent uh, RC filters, okay. I mean, you have a typical uh, uh, RC combination of a filter, single pole or double pole. These are lumped component because the, the wavelength is so large that uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, the wavelength is so large that uh, you can treat the component as lump components. Okay. So uh, depending on the frequency, you can have a you can have different uh, configurations. I mean, you can have very large uh, filters, amplifiers. Uh, you can have lump components, but at, as the, as the frequency becomes higher, you can have miniaturized circuits, you can have transmission lines, you can have microstrip lines. 
So it depends on the frequency, okay? And depending on the frequency, uh, different uh, uh, applications of uh, RF exist, okay? So um, AM radio, which is a pioneer broadcast service, it still exists along with the FM. Uh, television and two-way communications, uh, they're still in the radio spectrum. But radio now ha also includes, for example, digital broadcasting formats. There's radar, then you have surveillance, navigation, and broadcast satellites, which are towards the higher frequency ends. You have cellular telephones operating in GSM bands. And then you have uh, remote control devices, wireless data communications with less fading and uh, higher uh, bandwidths available for services. Uh, like uh, video communications, for example, okay, which requires more bandwidth. Then you have services, uh, uh, higher data rates available, so there are more services. So uh, the application of radio frequency technology outside radio include, for example, microwave heaters, uh, medical imaging for diagnostics, for example, MRIs, and then you have a cable television. Okay, so as as the um, as as the frequency uh, becomes higher, you have more bandwidth, and then you can transmit more uh, information or data, okay? So uh, the RF circuits that uh, handle or, or that, that are the basic building blocks of a certain RF system, uh, they deal with the RF signals, okay? They can be used to, for example, uh, generate, amplify, modulate, filter, demodulate, detect, and measure AC voltages and current at radio frequencies. So these circuits are going to handle RF signals at radio frequencies, okay? They, they can do it at 30 kilohertz at very low frequencies. Or they they could be at they could be handling the signal that at gigahertz frequency range at microwave frequency range. Okay, so depending on the frequency again, the circuits they uh, could be lump circuit components or they could be they could be waveguides. Okay, it could be uh, the circuit could consist of quartz cables. Okay, and instead of having physical wires, so it depends on the frequency. Okay, but the basic uh, you know the design uh, of such circuits and analysis. Uh, is this the, the 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 design is the same okay i mean what they are going to do is the same which is a filter it's going to accept some frequencies to pass through and it's going to reject some of the frequencies but uh, it could be a microstrip filter okay uh, or it could be a, a lumped rc filter so they are the blocks from which the rf systems are designed all right now they, they they can scale up down in both power and frequency for example a six section band pass filter with a given uh, passband shape, for example, might be a large water cooled in one application, but some manager is another. So it, it all depends on the frequency. So depending on the frequency, this filter might be made of sheet metal boxes, pipes, of solenoid coils, capacitors, or piezo uh, mechanical resonators. Yet the underlying circuit design remains the same. So, for example, a Class C amplifier circuit might be a small section of an IC for a wireless data link or uh, the largest part of a multi megawatt broadcast transmitter. Again, the design principles are the same. So, for example, a Class C amplifier is a non linear uh, amplifier. Why it's non linear? Because it implies a switching element, for example, a transistor, which is, uh, let's say, uh, conducting, uh, which is on for 90 degree conduction or, let's say, quarter of a cycle. So it's very efficient because it's, uh, the transistor is not on all the time. Okay, yet it does synthesizes uh, any sort of a waveform that is required. It could the output can still be a 360 degree cycle. So uh, again, depending on the frequency, it can be a miniaturized circuit on an IC. Okay, for example, if uh, uh, it's on a it's on a cellular mobile phone, it could be a very small circuit. Uh, but if it has to be, I mean, uh, if it is being used as a, for example multi-megawatt broadcast transmitter for AM communication, then the frequency is low, it could be a very large circuit. I mean, it could be based on vacuum tubes, for example. Vacuum tubes are, uh, you must understand, they're, they're, the operation is the same as the transistor, but but they are, uh, they are very primitive. I mean, uh, uh, they existed before 1950s, before the transistor came into the existence. So for large multi-megawatt applications, Class C amplifier could be, they could be huge circuits, okay? Uh, to handle a large power for transmission, let's say, okay. Um, now, uh, something about the nature of RF signals is that um, if, you, uh, if you look at the uh, spectrum of the uh, RF signals on the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, there's, a, there's a parameter now on a structural bandwidth, okay, so let's go back and have a look at the um, spectrum. Now, uh, at, at, for example, at, at super high frequencies where the satellite communication is done, 
uh, the fraction bandwidth of such signal is very small. I mean, we can talk of fraction bandwidth as a percentage. Uh, fraction bandwidth would be something like this. You, know, you see, this, this, this is the frequency scale. Then, uh, let's say this is my 3 dB frequency, and this is my center frequency. And the center frequency is, let's say, in the range of gigahertz. Okay. Um, it could be this range, for example. Okay. So uh, if it is if it is unmodulated, let's say if it is unmodulated, then it's a very narrow band signal, almost sinusoid. Okay. I mean the bandwidth is is very small. So this um, um, quantity fraction bandwidth is defined as uh, the absolute bandwidth. So it's, it's defined in, in terms of percentage. Okay. So it's defined as a 3 dB bandwidth. 3 dB is where the uh, power is 70 percent of maximum, right? Uh, or if um, the magnitude it is 70 percent, but the power becomes half. Okay, so at 70 percent of magnitude, let's say of the signal uh, divided by the center frequency, the center frequency you see uh, is in the microwave uh, region, uh, in gigahertz, let's say, and if, if let's say if it is an unmodulated signal, then uh, then it's very small. It's a, it's a very small value. So the fraction bandwidth of such signal is small, and you can treat those signals as as a, a sinusoidal signal. So uh, the way you are going to analyze those are the, the circuits, I mean, you can you can still use the uh, AC analysis so that the steady state uh, solutions for such uh, circuits, uh, there again they come up they come up at, at the same frequency as the generator frequency. Okay, you can use the uh, sinusoidal AC analysis to analyze the circuit as long as the circuits are linear. Okay, so note that uh, most frequency allocations have the small fractional bandwidth. It means the bandwidth are small compared to the center frequencies. Okay. So the fraction bandwidth of a signal, and this is this is in percentage, but the fraction bandwidth of a signal uh, from any given transmitter is less than 10 percent, usually usually much less, okay, even less. So it follows that uh, the RF voltage throughout a radio system are very nearly sinusoidal. So an otherwise purely sinusoidal RF carrier voltage must be modulated, varied in some way. To transmit the information. So every type of modulation, audio, video, pulse, digital coding, etc., work by amplitude or phase of uh, by by varying the amplitude or phase frequency for sensor RF wave is called the carrier wave. So unless it is not modulated, I mean, uh, for example, uh, you have a uh, let's say a cosine omega C T, omega C could be any frequency in the radio spectrum. And uh, if this is, if let's say this is mixed with uh, another uh, signal having different frequency, which is usually less than uh, uh, omega C, let's say omega M. So omega M is the uh, message signal frequency, let's say, which, which we intend to transmit by mixing it with the carrier. So what we have is, is uh, the two frequencies, okay. So what we are going to do is, I mean, uh, once they are multiplied, we'll have a sum and difference of two frequencies. So this is omega C minus omega M uh, multiplied by T. Then you have another term we are going to add. This will be cosine of omega C plus omega M. So the spectrum widens. If you have a modulated signal, the first thing you want to notice is that the spectrum is more, okay. And then there is some amplitude term. I think this is about half. You have to uh, add this to complete the trigonometric identity. And what happens is that um, you uh, have around omega c, around omega c, there will be uh, some differences of frequencies. So this you are going to have this at omega c minus plus omega m. And then you are going to have another frequency at omega c minus omega n. Okay. So this is the modulated signal, and by modulation it means that you're going to mix it up with some other frequency. And by mixing it means that uh, a typical, uh, let's say, for example, cosine omega ct is a, is a typical sinusoid, which looks like this. But if it is more, if it, if it uh, is modulated by a low frequency carrier signal, and if you're going to modulate, uh, let's say, the amplitude. So let's say the cosine of omega t is something like this. So the result would be something like this. The envelope is going to be, I mean, there will be a variation in the amplitude. 
so this is this is a modulated signal okay in which the amplitude is being modulated at the same frequency as cosine omega empty. okay so it's like cosine omega empty which is riding on the amplitude of a carrier but the frequency of the modulated signal frequency of this signal is at the, at the frequency omega c okay i mean why the modulation is done is there are many advantages to that uh, there's no point in, in transmitting a carrier only uh, modulation is done to transmit an information and then at the receiver you can you can have this uh, omega c the carrier information which is in phase and at the same frequency as the carrier you can multiply this back again to you know uh, transfer the entire spectrum to dc okay there will be again some differences of the frequencies high frequencies can be low pass filtered out and the entire spectrum is going to be shifted at uh, at dc okay so you're going to have omega m and minus omega m okay and you can have you can you can have this filtered out okay so you are going to recover the same bandwidth around the dc okay so the higher frequencies will be at twice omega c you don't need them okay so uh, so i mean the, the 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 advantages of modulation is that for example if you have a radio station you know uh, the speed signal they are occupying the same frequency i mean the speed signal is uh, 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 I mean, you, you you might want to transmit a certain um, piece of a music or audio, let's say, uh, which has a frequency of uh, up till eight kilohertz or four kilohertz. Okay, and uh, with the four kilohertz bandwidth, um, if each station has to transmit at the same frequency, uh, then there will be a mix-up. Okay. Uh, you, and you're not going to make anything out of it uh, when you're going to listen to your car radio, for example. So you have to have different stations, allocations. I mean, there, there has to be different stations. So, so what each station, I mean, what, what happens in an FM uh, uh, allocation is that each station is transmitting the same uh, uh, range of music, speech, or data, uh, but each station has different carrier frequency, okay? It could be a 100 megahertz station. It could be uh, 101 megahertz. And then this bandwidth is uh, is around that, okay? Uh, so you, you don't have any mix-up. So 100 megahertz, you can tune tune your radio to 100 megahertz to listen one piece of music, and then you can tune to 101 megahertz, 102 megahertz. And since four kilohertz is a small band, so it's not going to interfere. Uh, so each station can be allocated different frequencies. So this is one of the advantages in, in modulation, in FM modulation, okay? You cannot transmit, uh, each station cannot transmit at, uh, for example, the same carrier. Each station has a different carrier frequency, okay. So, uh, an unmodulated carrier, again, uh, has, an, has a very small bandwidth. But if you are going to modulate any signal, then your bandwidth increases, okay. The bandwidth is, will, be, will be, for example, over here, the bandwidth of this signal is twice omega m, right. So uh, I mean this 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 modulation is done by by a sinusoid, right? But it could be any signal which has a certain uh, bandwidth. I mean, you can you can have another you can add another uh, signal. Let's say cosine of omega um, R D, all right? And then you have uh, an, uh, more spectral lines with, of course, different strengths. And for example, this signal will be omega C plus omega R, and then you will have another signal which will be Omega C minus Omega R. Okay, so the spectral lines are going to be concentrated across uh, around around the center frequency Omega C. Uh, if you have an unmodulated carrier, then the bandwidth is, is zero. It's, it's a sinusoidal signal. I mean, the, there's no bandwidth. There's no question of fractional bandwidth. Uh, it's zero. So it's a pure spectral line. It's a pure sinusoid. Okay, but modulation always broadens the line into spectral bands. For example, over here you have spectral band. Uh, depending on how many, uh, uh, what is the bandwidth of the signal? Uh, there could be there could be many spectral lines filling up in between, and you, you you're going to have a respectable bandwidth. Okay, so but the energy clusters around the carrier frequency. Okay, so the the, the energy is still centered on the carrier frequency, uh, which uh, the message signal has modulated. So oscilloscope traces of uh, the RF voltage in a transmitter, or on a transmission line or antenna are therefore nearly sinusoidal. Okay, because energy is clustered around the carrier 
and uh, the RF signals have a, have a very low fraction bandwidth. I mean, in this case, for example, uh, omega C is, uh, you can say the omega C is much, much larger than omega M. I mean, in, in, even in FM broadcast, you see, for example, we have a 100 megahertz station, okay, and this is the carrier frequency. And we're going, we have to uh, send a speech signal or a music signal which has a bandwidth of let's say 4 kilohertz or 8 kilohertz, okay. So it is still larger, it's much larger. It doesn't matter, I mean 100 megahertz plus 4 kilohertz is, is not a huge fractional bandwidth, it's a large, small fractional bandwidth. So when modulation is present, uh, the amplitude and the phase of the sinusoidal signal changes, uh, but only over many cycles, right. I mean, that modulation present, but what, what happens is that amplitude or any physical quantity, frequency or, for example, in FM, the frequency is changing with respect to the amplitude of the uh, modulating signal. And this is happening on, on many cycles. For example, over here, the amplitude is being modulated. The amplitude is being changed. Uh, all the, the carry frequency is, stays the same. Uh, the amplitude changes, and this happens uh, at the frequency of the modulating signal, the message signal, omega amp, right? Now, because of the narrow band characteristics, uh, the elementary sine wave AC circuit analysis serves for most of the RF work. So, this is an advantage. I mean, just like um, analyzing linear circuits, if you recall in your circuit theory courses, uh, what you were doing is, uh, based on the linearity of the circuit, uh, you're dealing with the capacitors, inductors, and resistors of their linear passive circuit elements. Lump circuit element analysis, AC analysis, can be done in the same way as for the RF uh, circuits because the fraction bandwidth is, is very small and they're nearly sinusoidal. So the AC circuit analysis is applicable to RF circuits. Now the standard method for AC circuit analysis uh, that treats the voltage and currents in a linear network is based on the linearity of circuit elements. Okay, so for example, if you're dealing with inductors, capacitors, resistors, they are linear circuit elements, unlike diodes or transistors, okay? Uh, they are linear circuit elements. So if you have uh, uh, diodes or transistors, well, then it's a nonlinear circuit, and you have to resort to, for example, harmonic valence simulations. You have to do nonlinear circuit analysis or transient analysis, time domain analysis, which could be a little, uh, let's say, difficult as compared to linear circuit analysis, okay? But if you have these, uh, the circuit is linear, AC circuit analysis works well. So when a sinusoidal, for example, voltage or a current generator drives a circuit made of linear elements, the resulting steady state uh, solutions in terms of voltage and currents will all be perfectly sinusoidal and will have the same frequency as that of generator. So normally we find the response uh, voltage and current amplitude phases at the load of a driven AC circuit by the mathematical artifice. The artifice is that we replace the given sinusoidal generator by a hypothetical generator whose time dependence is E j omega t. Now E j omega t is a complex uh, quantity having both real and imaginary parts. Now this source function has both a real and imaginary part, since E j omega t can be bifurcated into two quantities, real and imaginary, sine and cosine. Such non-physical, because it is complex source, leads to non-physical complex solutions, but they can be bifurcated into real and imaginary parts. So the real and imaginary parts of the solution are separately good physical solutions that corresponds uh, respectively to the real and imaginary parts of the complex source, right? So um, you see many, uh, you need, uh, many computer programs are available to, to do so, to find the currents and voltages in complicated AC circuits. Uh, most versions, like uh, most versions of SPICE, will do the steady state AC analysis, which is much simpler than the transient analysis, which is their primary function. Special linear AC analysis programs for RF and microwave work, such as Agile ADS, Advanced Design Systems, uh, Mimicad computer design tools include circuit models, for example, for strip lines, waveguides, and other RF components. So you can you can use many computer programs to solve for the circuits. Um, do the linear AC analysis if the circuit is is linear. You can shift the frequencies, for example, okay, and uh, come up with the steady state solutions, okay. So why, when the circuit has a simple topology, as is often the case, it can be reduced to a single loop by combining. Uh, obvious series and parallel branches, okay, and that, that can be done by computer programs. So uh, the value of this is seemingly indirect method of solution is the substitution of uh, complex source converts the set of linear differential equation to a set of easily solvable algebraic equation. I mean, there, there are many ways to look at the same circuit. Uh, if you have a linear algebraic equations, the coefficients will be, for example, impedance or, or, or admittances, uh, depending on how uh, you're solving the loops of the circuit. 
And you can solve for the voltage and currents. I mean, these algebraic equations can be solved by such programs, and you can have steady state solutions, right? So, um, I mean, the, the definition of impedance and impedance are uh, quite uh, obvious in the circuit analysis. So, the coefficients in the algebraic circuit equations are the functions of complex impedances, that is the ratio of voltage to current. Impedance is the ratio of voltage to current. And we have another quantity admittance, which is uh, the inverse of impedance. Okay, it's I by V, which is current by voltage for all LC circuit elements. So, if you have reactive circuit elements in the, in the circuit, if you have uh, reactive circuit elements like inductor or capacitances, then uh, you have to deal with the impedance or admittances, which in algebraic equations of the circuits uh, become the coefficients. They become the coefficients of such uh, equations. So, the, for example, for example, the voltage across an inductor is uh, L dI by dt. And if the current is, let's say, I naught E J omega T uh, at a certain frequency, then the voltage is uh, the multiplication of these two quantities, right? So what 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 that means is that if you're multiplying the current, the current which is driving the uh, inductor at a certain frequency, this quantity becomes the uh, impedance. Okay, the impedance is a frequency domain concept, right? So this quantity is Z, is the impedance of the inductor at the frequency at which the current source is driving the inductor. So the impedance and admittance of an inductor are there respectively J mega L, that's the impedance. And then you have uh, the admittance 1 over J mega L, which is, let's say, let's note this by Y, and that's precisely uh, 1 over Z. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the inverse of the impedance. Okay, similarly, if you consider the current into a capacitor, that is C dV by dt, well, this quantity can be written as uh, J omega C into V, okay? And what is this equal to? This is I, right? So you can derive the admittance and impedance from these quantities. I mean, this I by V is your admittance, right? I mean, by this definition. So this is Y admittance. Let's denote this by Y. And your J mega C is your admittance. This is J mega C. And the inverse of that, inverse of Y, becomes your impedance, right? 1 over Y. And that is precisely 1 over J mega C, okay? So the impedance and impedance of <laughs> resistor are just a reciprocal quantities, R and 1 over R. Um, and you see the elements in series, uh, since they have the same current, so you have to add their impedance. I mean, the total impedance uh, in the series connection is the sum of their separate uh, respective impedances. Uh, but in parallel, since they have the same voltage, so you have to add the admittance. Okay. So, I mean, the way you are going to solve the circuit, it depends on if you have to solve for the parallel branch and series branches. Uh, if it is a series branch, the total impedance is the sum of the separate impedances. If it is a parallel branch, you know that the voltage is the same across the nodes. And uh, you can add, you can work with the admittance, which is more convenient, right? I mean, you, you can add the separate admittances. Uh, the real and imaginary parts of impedances are called the resistance and reactance, while the imaginary parts, uh, real and imaginary parts of admittance, reciprocal of impedance, which is the reciprocal of impedance, are called conductance and susceptance. Well, what it says is that, uh, again, your impedance is going to have both real and imaginary parts. So the real part of uh, impedance is... Uh, it's the resistive part, so let's denote this by R. Similarly, the imaginary part of impedance is the reactive part. So, imaginary part of the resistance is the reactive part. Okay, so, I mean, in that sense, the impedance, uh, if you combine these two, the impedance Z is going to be written as uh, R plus GX. Okay. Similarly, the admittance can be written in terms of uh, conductance, let's say V, and susceptance, uh, well, conduct, let, let's denote this by G, that's how the uh, in literature it has gone. So G denotes conductance plus susceptance, another quantity, susceptance, JV. Okay, so this part, the real part is your conductance, uh, G is conductance and B is susceptance, this is susceptance. And they, there again, uh, I mean, since Y and Z are reciprocal, this is um, 
for example, uh, susceptance of a capacitor is not 1 over J megacy, it's J megacy, right? It, it's a megacy, it's simply megacy. And <coughs> conductance uh, for a resistor is 1 over R, okay? So it's 1 over R. So this is conductance, okay? Again, conductance and admittance, uh, well, no, sorry, the uh, admittance and impedance are, uh, are reciprocal quantities, okay? They are reciprocal quantities. Okay, um, let's talk about series resonance circuit. It's a very basic uh, circuit which consists of, uh, let's say, an inductor and a capacitor in series. And uh, let's say it's, it's a lossless combination, so there is no resistance associated with the, I mean, the quality factor is, is infinite. The, there's no resistance associated with the, uh, with the inductor uh, series resistance. And for the capacitor, we ignore any dielectric loss, which is filling in the between parallel plates. So we have an ideal, let's say, inductor and capacitor in series. And if, uh, you know, for a, a capacitor inductor in series, if you combine their uh, impedances, I mean, what is the total impedance of this combination? So let's note this by Zs. Well, that can be written as at a, at a particular frequency, this is J omega L, and then we have uh, 1 over J omega C. If you combine these two quantities, combine these two quantities, this is what you get. And if you note that at a certain frequency, omega equal to 1 over square over LC, if you substitute this frequency over here, Okay, then this combination becomes equal to zero. So, but what it means is that if I denote this frequency as omega r, okay, then my series combination Zs at omega r, the series impedance at omega r is zero. Well, it means that we have a perfect short circuit, right? So, at this resonant frequency, the series LC circuit is a perfect short circuit. Um, it, 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 it implies many things. I mean, the thing is, uh, you don't have any potential difference. The potential difference becomes zero. One way to look at this is that, uh, well, the inductor is, you know, inductor stores energy uh, in, term, in its uh, magnetic field, and capacitor stores energy in its uh, electric field. Uh, they both develop voltages, which are of equal and opposite signs at this particular frequency, uh, omega r, and the net result is that, and uh, the net result is that the, uh, the, the short circuit voltage is zero, okay? So equal voltages are developed across the inductor and capacitor with opposite signs, so the net voltage becomes zero. So there's no power transfer. I mean, power transfer is Vi, so there's no power being transferred in or out of the circuit, okay? The power is simply sloshing back and forth between L and C uh, components. So at resonance, there's no transfer of energy in or out of the combination since the overall voltage is always zero. So the power is always zero. However, the circuit does contain stored energy which simply sloshes back and forth between the inductor and capacitor, right? So, uh, so you must remember for a, for a series LC circuit, um, series LC circuit at resonance frequency, uh, the, uh, I mean, at, at series LC resonance, the, the circuit appears as short circuit, okay? And uh, at frequencies around omega r, which is uh, when the frequency is not equal to omega r, well, then you have uh, impedance, okay, which is, which is going to be offered by both inductor and capacitor in series, and the signal is going to be impeded, okay? I mean, this, this is shown in this um, a very simple ADS schematic. This is, uh, this is a schematic in advanced design systems, and you can see an AC circuit analysis being carried out. It's a linear circuit. Uh, we have inductor and a capacitor combination, then there's a load of 1 ohm. Uh, what it says is that uh, you're going to start with, uh, for example, 10 hertz frequency, and you're going to sweep this uh, up until 20 kilohertz. So this is the frequency scale, okay? It starts at about 10, uh, very small frequency, it's around DC. You, you can consider this to be DC, 0 hertz, 10 hertz, which is 10 hertz, and then it goes all the way up to 20 kilohertz, okay? Now, um, if you calculate the combination, this the resonance frequency LC and if you multiply this with 2 pi this frequency comes out to be and just substitute those values for 100 micro henrys and 22 micro farads well, this comes out to be precisely about 3.4 kilohertz and you can see at this frequency what is happening is that uh, this magnitude VLC this VLC is being defined as the potential difference V2 this is the difference between this node voltage and this node voltage uh, you have a perfect short circuit. I mean, the voltage goes to zero, right? The voltage goes to zero. This M4 marker is showing that the voltage is going to zero. 
So at this frequency, uh, this becomes a short circuit. I mean, you have a short circuit over here. And what happens is that once you have a short circuit, the maximum power is transferred to the load, right? And uh, this is a magnitude of V2. And at this frequency, you have the maximum power that is transferred. This my M1 marker is showing the maximum power that is being transferred. So, uh, but around that uh, frequency M1, you have M2 and an M3, uh, which are different. Uh, this is about this is th this 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 bandwidth is basically the 3 dB bandwidth. I mean, this is where the magnitude uh, or the power falls to half. Okay, the magnitude falls to 70 percent. Okay, this is about 70 percent. And uh, the power, if you consider this is a magnitude of the voltage, but if you consider the power V2 square over uh, V square over R, that's the power V square over R, then it becomes half. Okay, so we are considering 3 dB bandwidth. So 3 dB bandwidth is uh, again, I mean, this is the difference between 2.7 and 4.3. So the difference is about um, is about 1.6 kilohertz. And what it shows is that if the frequency is not 3.4 kilohertz, then we have impedance, right? I mean, the magnitude of the voltage is falling on either end, and this 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 fall continues, right, on either end. So, uh, if the circuit is not being driven at omega r, I mean, if the frequency is not equal to uh, omega r, then you have the impedance uh, of the signal. It is going to be transmitted at the load, and this impedance is due to the reactive elements. They are going to provide resistance at that frequency. If the frequency is equal to omega r, right, then uh, you have the maximum transmission at that particular frequency because it's a short circuit and you are going to provide the maximum signal strength at the load. So for different frequencies, when omega is not equal to omega r, uh, you're going to have impedance uh, in the signal and uh, you won't have any maximum power delivery to the load, right? Okay. So you must remember that uh, for a series resonance circuit at, at resonance frequency, the series combination is a short circuit. Okay. Otherwise, you have uh, reactive impedance present, which is going to impede the signal. So uh, similarly, we have a parallel resonance circuit. So a capacitor inductor can be connected in parallel. And then for a parallel combination, since the voltage is same, okay, so the voltage, uh, let's say this is a node voltage V2, and then we have the node voltage V1, this combination V2 minus V1 is the potential difference between two nodes. Uh, the voltage is the same, so what you're going to do is you have, um, you can consider the admittance. Okay, so admittance is uh, J mega C and 1 over J mega, combine them. And again, you see it comes out, turns out that uh, at the same resonance frequency, uh, the combination is a perfect open circuit. So it's like a, uh, before that, for example, we have a, we have a sort of a, band pass response, okay, band pass response means, it, it looks like, I mean, the frequency response looks like a band pass filter. So your, the circuit is passing the frequencies, uh, is favoring frequencies which are around the center frequency, which is 3.4 kilohertz, which is around the resonance. But as you move away, as you start moving away, then you have uh, the transmission is, uh, is, uh, is becoming smaller and smaller at higher and lower frequencies. But at the center frequency, uh, the circuit is favoring more more uh, power to the frequencies which can be delivered to the load. Uh, but the reverse happens when there's a parallel combination. So you have an open circuit, first of all, that, that you must realize, uh, because this combination becomes zero. The admittance is zero, or you can say that uh, your uh, impedance becomes infinite. Okay, so these both conditions are for open circuit conditions. Uh, and what it means is that now if you consider uh, uh, same valued capacitor inductor connected in parallel, uh, at open circuit condition, the maximum voltage occurs okay, at the same frequency, 3.41 kilohertz. But uh, the transmission at the load, uh, this is this is no, this is this is the current okay, which is being measured. This is a series probe, and uh, this uh, denotes the current. So the current becomes zero at 3.4 kilohertz. Why it becomes zero? Because you have an open circuit. You have an open circuit at omega r, which is 3.4 kilohertz again. Okay. So no power uh, is transmitted to the load at 3.4 kilohertz. So it's like a band stop filter. Okay. Then again, you have other frequencies. I mean, now if you take the maximum 70%, this is the magnitude of the current. So if you take the 70% of uh, uh, the maximum 0.1 over here, 0.07, uh, 
this represents the 3db bandwidth okay this is the frequency around which uh, the circuit is not going to favor any power uh, delivered to the load i mean those frequencies which are around uh, 3.4 kilohertz okay it's going to attenuate those frequencies okay but frequencies away from this it's the other way around so band stop filter response so the frequencies which are uh, uh, not around um, even 4 kilohertz it's going to it's going to pass them through right so uh, what happens is that it becomes an open circuit and it doesn't transfer any power around the uh, resonant frequency at which, which the uh, parallel combination of lc circuit becomes an open circuit right but these are basic building blocks i mean uh, you must understand the parallel resonance and the series resonance because uh, uh, we're going to construct filters uh, which are uh, based on it's a lossless filter based on LC circuit components only. And uh, this phenomena is modeled uh, uh, much more over there. So these are the basics but which, which you must appreciate. And the other thing that you must appreciate is that the resonance frequency, for example, over here is small, 3.4 kilohertz only. We're not talking of megahertz or gigahertz. So we still can more, you know, model this by uh, lumped circuit elements and can uh, uh, do the AC analysis, okay? So, uh, that's something you that uh, you must have noticed over here. We have lump circuit elements because the frequency is low. Okay, we, we are not talking of microstrip lines or waveguides at high frequencies. Um, okay, so series LC section equivalence is at resonance is a short circuit. Uh, if, if we have a parallel LC section, then its equivalence at resonance is an open circuit. Okay, now we we, we have nonlinear circuits. I mean, even at low frequencies, there are many important RF circuits. For example, mixers and modulators, even nonlinear amplifiers, detectors, that are based on nonlinear circuit elements like diodes, p junction diodes, okay, or we can have saturated transistors which are used being used as switches. Uh, now transistors and diodes, they don't have a linear IV characteristics. You recall that for a typical diode, it's an exponential in the forward bias region. And then in the reverse bias region, uh, there's a small saturation current before it breaks down and avalanche break, uh, breakdown occurs and you have a burn out of the device, a large current flow. So this is the, the IV characteristics are, uh, uh, you understand, are non-linear. Okay, similarly for transistor, we don't have a linear IV characteristic. So these, these are not linear elements, okay? I mean, a typical diode has a characteristic like this. So you cannot treat this as a, long, as a linear element. We cannot do the AC analysis. So we cannot use the linear E, J, omega, D, or linear AC analysis, um, but must use the time domain analysis. I mean, the static solution is not going to be at the same frequency. So it's a non-linear circuit component, okay? It's going to produce harmonics, and we have to do the, for example, harmonic balance simulation, right? So for non-linear circuit, um, circuits employing diodes and switches, we have to resort to time domain an analysis, which is which could be complicated as compared to AC analysis. So usually, usually we can, you know, uh, uh, ease the things out by uh, using piecewise linear models. I mean, for example, usually, the non-linear elements can be replaced by simple models to explain the circuit operation. And if, we, you, if you can linearize the circuits uh, for a certain frequency of operation or for a small band or range of frequencies uh, where it can be linearized, then uh, fine, you can go out with the AC analysis. Uh, but that can be limited. I mean, full-blown uh, uh, circuit analysis has to be done on, has to be done in a time domain manner, uh, or you can use harmonic balance simulations. So full computer modeling can be used for accurate circuit simulations to solve such circuits. Okay. All right, that's it.